Well, hello and welcome again to uh, Bio 220, Microbiology. This lecture is additional lesson material provided by uh, outgoing chair Lynn, Professor Lynn DeSanto that the course designer felt belonged in this lesson module. It simply goes over the differences of eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, and well, Thankfully, it's a very short lesson. Thank goodness. Well, pro prokaryotic cells, what's special about them is that their DNA is not enclosed in a specific organelle or a nucleus, and it's actually free-floating inside its body, per se. It uh, acts as, it forms a singular circular chromosome, which is referred to as a nucleoid, and the DNA prokaryotic cells is not associated with histones. They don't get compartmentalized and wrapped around. Prokaryotic cells lack specific organelles. However, they do sometimes have some inclusions that store certain materials. And then they have cell walls that always contain polysaccharide peptidoglycan, except in the case of archaea. Now these cells divide by binary fission by splitting apart and DNA is copied and the cell splits in two. There is no mitosis or meiosis though. Prokaryotic cells are unicellular, extremely small, and include both bacterial and archaea. The cell structures that are external to prokaryotic cells include the chycalyx, which is the thick gelatinous polymer external to the cell wall that is made up of polysaccharide and polypeptide, or both. This structure aids in the bacterial, in the bacteria in avoiding phagocytosis by larger cells, resisting antibiotics and the formation of capsules and slime layers. It has flagella, which are long fil filamentous appendages that help for their movement. They have fimbrae, which are hair-like appendages that are much shorter, straighter, and thinner than flagella, and they also are involved in aiding the bacteria in its adherence or connection to certain surfaces, such as epithelial cells, and also helps in the formation of biofilms, such as what we see in our teeth. There are pili, which are longer than fimbrae, and, but shorter than flagellum, and they number usually one to two per cell. Pili are involved in motility, as well as the transfer of DNA from one bacteria to another, or one prokaryote to another. The axial filaments, they are not external to the cell wall, but act as endoflagellum or axial filament. These fibrils wrap around the cell, and the rotation of these axial filaments propel the bacteria spirochets in a spiral motion. Eukaryotic cells, well, they have their DNA protected and enclosed in a nuclear membrane, which forms the nucleus. And then DNA, when necessary, can be found in multiple different chromosomes instead of just one single circular chromosome like in prokaryotes. The DNA is aligned through molecules called histones and non-histones. Eukaryotic cells contain many different membrane bound organelles that have specific functions. These can be mitochondria, endoplasm and reticulum, as well as many more. If they have cell walls, like in the case of plants, the cell walls are very simple. And in the case of cell division, it involves mitosis to form new cells from old cells, and in which chromosomes take shape replicate and are distributed into two different nuclei as that larger cell breaks up into two new cells. Cytokinesis is what follows and divides the cytoplasm into two new cells. The eukaryotic structures are ex that are external to the cell also include flagella, but also cilia. These productions contain cytoplasm and are enclosed by the plasma membrane. The flagellum are few but very long, and the short and numerous projections of the cilia 
Both are used for locomotion. Most karyotic cells contain cell walls. They have plants and algae. Plants and algae have cell walls of cellulose. Fungi have cell walls made of chitin, and yeast have walls composed of glucan and mannan. Eukaryotes lacking a cell wall, as in the case of animals, the plasma membrane is the outermost covering. However, protozoans contain a thick pellicle, pellicle external to the plasma membrane. Certain animal cells also have a glycolyx composed of thick carbohydrates used in anchoring the cell. Plasma membrane in eukaryotic cells contain sterols, allowing eukaryotic cells to resist lysis. Now this just further goes into structures that are actually common to both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, which includes membrane, plasma membranes, cytoplasm, and ribosomes. Though the functions may be slightly different or more complex in different situations. When comparing the two, prokaryotes are, have one circular chromosome that is not a membrane, where eukaryotes have pairs of chromosomes that are protected in a nuclear membrane. And well, as far as the cell walls, prokaryotes, if they're bacteria, have peptidoglycan cell walls, archaea have pseudomurin cell walls, and they always divide by binary fission. Where eukaryotes, they, if they do have a cell wall, it's usually very simple. And in the case of animal cells, there isn't even a cell wall. And they produce more cells by mitosis. On the inside of eukaryotic cells, there are organelles that have specific functions. There's the endoplasmic reticulum, which helps form initial proteins. The Golgi apparatus, which processes, modifies, and sends out proteins. And, well... There is also the nucleus, which protects the DNA. There is a process of gene regulation, which is the trans, which involves transcription in prokaryotes to form the synthesis of RNA from its DNA. Ribosomal RNA is a major portion of protein synthesis. Messenger RNA carries coded information for making proteins from DNA to ribosomes, where protein can then be synthesized by chaining together multiple amino acids. During transcription, a strand of mRNA is synthesized using a portion of DNA as a template. And as that mRNA is constructed, eventually it will go through transcription begins, where the RNA polymerase binds to a site promoter this allows short-term copies of genes to be made for protein synthesis. Now, the next process after transcription is translation, which takes, which decodes the genetic material that is now in mRNA and uses it to translate it into the protein domain. This uses three chains of nucleic acids called codons for any particular amino acid. Protein synthesis from transcription and translation to protein creation happens simultaneously and in the cytosol of the cytoplasm. In eukaryotic cells, transcription takes place specifically, I should say that trans transcription and translocation happens in the cytosol. For prokaryotes, but in eukaryotes, transcription selectively happens in the nucleus an mRNA must be synthesized and then moved out of the nuclear membrane into the cytoplasm before translation can ever occur. Also, mRNA is processed before leaving the nucleus. As far as the regulation of bacterial gene expression, bacteria can participate in numerous varied metabolic reactions. These reactions are all catalyzed by enzymes, which are proteins that are created through transcription and translation. Protein synthesis requires energy. Bacteria can conserve energy by only making certain proteins when needed, though. 
may genes are usually turned off, but make consistent amounts of proteins routinely. Examples of this would be enzymes that bacteria need all the time, where the genes must always be active. There are two control mechanisms to help gene regulation. There's repression and induction, which regulate the transcription of RNA and thus the production of enzymes. Repression inhibits a gene from being expressed and thus decreases the enzyme synthesis, usually due to an overabundance of an end product by that enzyme. But there is also induction, which is the process that turns on the process of transcription and translation. There is the lac-operon system found in E. coli, which is an example of an inducible system. This material right here is more appropriate if you take a cellular and molecular biology course, such as the operon model of gene expression where bacteria are constantly exposed to ever-changing environments, and because of this, they have to be able to alter their gene expression quickly and efficiently. They express different enzymes for different reactions depending on the carbon source and other nutritional sources available for them at a given time. Bacteria in the presence of lactose have to be able to very quickly make the enzymes needed to convert lactose into something they can actually use. E. coli is a great example of the induction of lactose enzyme in the catabolism of lactose called the lac operon model, which was first discovered by Jacob and Monod. The lac operon contains three genes that encode proteins involved in lactose metabolism, lacZ, lacY, and lacA, which encode lacZ, Galab lactosidase, lac Y permease, and the lac A encodes for the enzyme transacetylase. These genes lie on a continuous piece of DNA and are part of the lac operon and can be co regulated very easily and simultaneously. The organization of these genes allows the simultaneous expression of all the genes coded in this operon. And well, the structure of operon along a DNA chain usually involves a promoter and then an operon region, an operon or an operator sequence, and then the actual genes themselves. The pro promoter really helps tell where RNA polymerase can begin the transcription of DNA into mRNA. And then the operator, it really acts as like a traffic light signaling to stop or go for a transcription of the structural genes, which are actually used to encode for, say, in the case of a regulatory gene, it is a gene that encodes for a repressor protein that eventually switches inducible operons on and off. Now, an inducible operon in the absence of lactose that the repressor binds to the operon site and then prevents further transcription of that DNA. So in essence, if there is no lactose, a repressor molecule will bind and prevent the transcription of this of these genes. Therefore, they can never they won't be active anymore until eventually lactose is present and the cell needs to use the lac operon again. Now repressor inactivate operon on in the presence of lactose the intermediate allolactase binds with the repressor no longer blocking transcription. So essentially in the presence of this results in the enzymes needed for lactose catabolism to once again be created. Positive regulation is a process where regulation of the lac operon depends on the level of glucose present, in turn controls the level of the small molecule cyclic AMP, also called CAMP. 
This serves as an alarm signal. Enzymes that degrade glucose are constitutive with bacteria growing at their best in the presence of glucose. However, when glucose is not present, the CAMP complex accumulates and binds with the allosteric site of catabolic activator protein CAP. This then binds to the LAC operon, which begins transcription by making it easier for RNA polymerase to bind to the promoter. Thus, transcription of the LAC operon requires both the presence of lactose and the absence of glucose to properly occur. And these are just diagrams that show different substances and, well, their impact on the LAC operon and E. coli. Well, this includes just additional lesson material outside the textbook that was provided by Professor Lynn DeSanto. This concludes Module 2's lesson material as far as lecture goes, though there are going to be a few other videos or lessons pertinent later on. Anyways, you're all doing great sticking through this variety of information. Keep it up. You're getting close to the halfway point, and you all still continuously impress me for doing such an intense course in such a condensed format. Peace to all of you, and catch you in Module 3 and 4.